That's why you always want to talk about it. Okay, so page two. Are you guys learning something? Yeah. Like we've literally only gone through a couple of disclosures in page one. So, um, uh, and, li and constantly going to tell you about by ourselves. Who had a question? Uh-huh. Um, I want to ask something. I have my first and only transaction. So I use escrow account for my first. No, it's not your only transaction. It was. Your first transaction so far, right? Okay. By the way, I, okay, can I let you guys know, I'm never being condescending or being mean to you. I'm helping you correct your language. Thank you. Okay, so, I, yeah, you know, yeah, I want to make it out there so that, because when we say only, we're putting out there that maybe our only thing ever, right? I'm going to help you say first one so far. Yeah, yeah. so I okay. have a really great um, experience because um, I emailed uh, my coach in the Power Curve and Lynn, and she helped me correct my contract. And Donna helped me face to face. And then um, I want to share something about the buyer, the net sheet. Actually, we talk, we were taught in the class how to do it ourselves. But I go to Jenna, and then she did the whole package. If you guys go to the escort training, she mentioned the folder and mm -hmm. saw print out and the color page, why use us, and the schedule to pay the test, and also have a white ribbon. Yes, right, you're so cute. Yeah. Remember, it's giving the stuff, but that's also why we want to have a buyer book that we've created, and it has the escrow information in there, title information, everything for them to see ahead of time. While you're looking at homes, they should have this book with them every time you go to look. So it makes look really good. It makes it look really good. Exactly like how much they pay. And Jenna also mentioned one thing during the training. She said, since I know I'm not going to get that escrow, I'm going to make it really low. Right. So just, you know, just to to stir the power, whatever. But then we use that to negotiate, the, to help the buyer to get a lower from the other side of the escrow. Because at the end of the escrow, actually the agent asked me, hey, where's the email? Because she can use that to negotiate with his, uh, her uh, seller to get a lower right. rate. So and when we get to the escrow part, I'm going to tell you another thing to put in your counters. Your counters are going to get a lot bigger, just so you know. And my average counter would have like 11 or 12 items. Yeah. That's going to make you savvy. And, and I would, by the way, I would call the other agent. Don't let my counter scare you. <laughs> Tell your client, don't be scared. A lot of this is just terms. I like to spell them out. Then they're done that. And I'm just really honest about it, right? And when I say I'm just, I'm not really out there, son, but this is, um, I, but when I, when I am taking, like if one of you wanted help, I would mentor you through it. And then the, those are the things I would tell you to say. Okay, so thanks for sharing. Cool. And I can't wait for your next transaction. <laughs> okay, so verification of down payment and closing costs. Um, if you want to get a stronger offer, one for so for um, if you're the listing agent, don't miss this one, right? If it says verification attached, what do you make sure? Yeah. It's attached. What else do you make sure of? And I'm going to give you make you more savvy for uh, if you're the listing agent. Verification is of the whole down. So the mm -hmm. Deposit, uh, down payment, as well as closing cost, based on the first page, right? Also, uh, what else do you, if, if I was going to do verification, one, do you accept a letter this, from a bank? This person has this money in there. No. I've been a lender. That takes word on a computer. Okay? Does not take any verification. You want to see what? Statements. Statements. You're okay if they black out the account number, right? That is fine. Um, here's where you're going to be savvier as the listing agent. The last 60 days worth. You must ask for the last 60 days worth. Why? Seasoned money. Seasoned money. Exactly. Thank you, Paul. Um, because if they just had something dumped in there yesterday or last week and you're closing in 30 days, that might get kicked at the lender. Because guess what the lender asked for? 60 days, right? Guess what else is on a bank statement? Average balance. They want all pages of those bank statements. So when you go back in your counter, because even if they say it's attached, it will never be satisfactory when you're a listing agent. Just so you know, to say verification attached, you need to go back and say, and this is how you're going to counter it. Uh, before accepting, buyer must provide 60 days of uh, proof of assets from same account. So let's say they do two accounts, 60 days, two accounts. So buyer must provide proof of funds for last for the um, previous 60 days. 
So it must be the most present 60 days. Okay. And in 2018, are there any excuses that work? Well, they haven't got their statement yet. Log in on this thing called online banking. All right. Is everyone in this room on online banking? Yes. Right. Can you get your statement? Yes. PDF format, huh? Yes. Are you on wireless or, or what? Are, what do they call it? Paperless now? Yes. You don't even get statements anymore, right? Can you walk into a bank? Mm -hmm. yes. Will they print it out for you right there? Yes. Right. There's no excuse. There's absolutely no excuse. If the agent starts giving you excuses, number one reason: difficult agent. Take that into consideration. You may not want to go Nesco with that agent. Number two, hiding something. The number one is the number one. <laughs> okay, usually it's difficult agent, power struggle. Okay, so find out if that's the situation. Um, and number two would be they're hiding something or they don't have the funds. You just need to get, because you just don't want your escrows falling apart, right? You don't want your escrows falling apart. And be nice about it to the agent. Don't power struggle back. Just go, hey, we want to go next. We want a smooth escrow. That's all we want, right? You too, I'm sure. We just want to get all of this out now. This is what my seller is asking for. They're a very savvy seller. It's not their first video. Can you just provide this because we have other, uh, I mean, no one else has had a problem doing that. Right? Okay. So just go there. Um, okay. So appraisal, contingency, and removal. So funny when we go through these uh, contingencies. You know you could put, like, no contingency on the appraisal and all these other things. However, you still have contingencies in place. And you can cancel for what reason? You don't have to give one. And we'll get to that part of the contract. And this is when you, if you ever are canceling, the buyer chooses to cancel per what, 14 years in the new contract. And that is, and you're just like, that's it. And if the uh, listing agent calls you, I want to know why, we just want to stick to the contract. They're going to cancel on, uh, based on the contract. So unless you remove the contingencies. So sometimes I will tell you, um, so appraisal contingency, the standard 17 days. Again, call the listing agent ahead of time. Not every listing agent is going to be savvy. Ask them what the seller is looking for. We would like a 10-day appraisal agent, uh, contingency. Fine. Is the loan contingent on the appraisal? Yes. Right? So, I mean, it's just silly. It's silly. Just appease the person, but I'll show you where you can keep the contingencies in place for your buyer. Um, and then no is the listing agent. <laughs> It's not going to mean much, you know, if they remove the, the appraisal contingency. They, if they have other contingencies in place, they can still cancel. So, and you need to tell your seller that too. Because, like, the appraisal didn't come in. Well, they can't cancel because of the appraisal. Sure, they can. Sure, they can. Okay, so it really doesn't mean much other than negotiations and, and people thinking they mean something, people thinking it's stronger. Um, but, you know, ask them what will make them happy. And make it all egos happy and all of that. Uh, if it's not contingent on appraisal, you can put it in there. When is it not contingent normally? Cash. Cash, right? Um, and when they're not going to do one, right? So if they're doing cash, do cash offers also want to buy at or below market? Yes. Right? So find out if they're going to do one. They always recommend that they do one regardless, okay? Okay, you find out a lot of things in appraisal that you don't even find out in a home inspection, right? Now, all the seasoned people are so funny when I say things, they're like, you have no idea. Um, they've been through all these things. So loan applications within three days, should you ever be putting in an offer without uh, this already being done? No. Right? Okay, so I, you could put one or zero or letter attached. If you're going to be representing the buyer, put letter attached and provide the letter. You're a better agent, and um, the listing agent is going to take you serious, okay? You have to, you're not just selling to the seller, you're selling to the agent, okay? So you've got to be taken serious. But if it's not attached, put one or zero, call the listing agent. Have you ever been out of town, and you didn't have it on you, or, or whatever, or something, or the lenders out of town? Call them, again, communication, say, hey, we have it. Um, I want to get you an updated one with the correct price on it. So I'm going to put one in there. I'll get it to you tomorrow. I don't have it right now. It's 10 o'clock at night. I just want to get this to you while I'm doing it. Okay. Um, buyer insists on it coming in. I want to let you know they're totally, but have the conversation. Because if not, they're like, they're not approved. They're not approved. Okay. Here's another thing that's going to go on your counter. And so I would often put it in the MLS, but it's got to go. If you're a listing agent, this goes in every counter. 
aspire to cross qualify mm -hmm. with the lender that you have the relationship with, right? Absolutely. We have an in-house one, right? Um, I would go a step further, aspire to be pre to be approved with so and so. I, I don't like cross qualify. Because all that means is they can give them whatever information, but I, I like to actually go through the underwriting process. Fire to be pre-approved? You're forcing double app. And that's the question. Do you have to force double app up to appraisal? No. Okay. No. No. Because the contract's already, um, like they can be approved with contingency, like, you know, with their, their terms. Sure. Um, that, that's fine. But you want to be approved. And you're doing that because you don't know their lender and you don't know what kind of trouble they're going to cause. And, and our guy can... And you're it. doing... And by the way, when you do listing appointments, yeah. you should always be telling your seller things that you do. I want to let you know every time we get an offer, we will make them get um, approved through our, our in-house lender as well. That's who I have a relationship with uh -huh. and I trust him. Right? Uh-huh. I've done a lot of transactions before myself. I had a buyer. Okay, you have, well, actually, that's a myth. Um, so you do have the right to give them, if you want to, like your credit report that you had before. But if, you are, if, you're, if you're applying for a loan within a certain amount of time, it's the same amount of points to your credit score. That's a huge, it counts as one. That's a myth. I don't know if this deal is going to go through or not. The next, you know, property I might want to buy, is it going to be the same? So the listing agent won't want to go into escrow with you if you don't know you want to buy this for sure and you're not willing to get pre-approved. Especially in this market. In this market, yeah. 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 How bad do you want the property? So this is something an agent, and by the way, totally legit, right? Yeah. Uh, totally legit objection. When you meet with your buyers ahead of time, go, I'm going to tell you something. Did you ever hear about the real estate crash? Right? Now you must qualify for your loans. When a, a seller is going to sell, they also want to make sure you can buy the property. Okay? So it's very common that they will make sure you are pre-approved. And this is what I would do if you want to be the greatest buyer's agent. So... Uh, one of the things, if you already have your lender, to avoid that, and this is what I would do, this is savvy, why don't you get pre-approved with our in-house lender now as well, and we give them two approvals. And you will probably get away with not cross-qualifying. Okay. Because if that agent picks up the phone to a listing agent, hey, I want to let you know, I always have, and if you have a good reputation, they'll probably know anyway, I always have all my buyers get pre-approved with our in-house lender even though they use other lenders. I have an approval for them. It's underwritten. I don't take, and, like, and this would be my sister because she's, she's just a tough person. Like She'd be like, I don't put anybody in my car take time away from my family until I have approval. Like She is that person, right? <laughs> and so I highly recommend it too, especially what, gas is like, what, $3.76 a gallon? Yeah, make sure they're approved before they go in that car. Mm -hmm. right, so I just got a counter offer, mm -hmm. and I have a question. Okay. <laughs> Live. <laughs> so uh, all buyers and businesses to be removed within 15 days mm -hmm. with no further notice to all parties. Does that mean that they don't need to be signed off? Mm -mm. No. So they can try to put that in the, they can try to put that in the counter. However, would it hold up in mediation and court? No, so in the contract it states that all, it, and it's a new thing, it didn't used to be back in the day when the contingency period up, it was just assumed the contingencies were up. You must physically remove contingencies. Yeah. yeah. And it's said in the counter that they don't have to? That's what they're yeah. doing? Yeah, and actually if something happened further, that the agent that wrote that up would probably be the one in trouble. Well, they're trying to set precedence, but it won't stand up. What yeah, they, it won't stand up. And again, it's an agent that really, Sorry, it's the, the agent really doesn't know what they're doing. They don't understand the contract like you guys will, right? Um, you can say, and, and if I was a buyer's agent and that was the only way of getting the house, I would laugh and say, accept it. Yeah. Is it a condo or a Yeah. Because guess what you also have, which we will get to, buyer to perform time. I mean, there's all kinds of ways. So really, is it 15 days or is it 17? You have to have two more days of buyer to perform time, right? Mm -hmm. 
Right. It is so hard to kick a buyer out of escrow, by the way. It is really yeah. hard. I mean, you could file an interpleader. I mean, it's just, it's really hard to get a buyer out of escrow if the seller doesn't have a contingency. Um, another thing, too, um, on that is do you realize even if you have a contingency period, let's say it's 15 days, but on the 14th day, they gave you the termite report. What do you get? Three extra days to go over it. You've got five days to review every document from the time you receive it. That's why you need to be on your game and your TC yeah. needs to be on your game yeah. and get those disclosures out. And because I've used that five day, they're like, oh, they even performed us. I'm like, I'm going to take everything off except for this that I just got yesterday. I've got four more days to review it. So then, Robin, in yeah. this example, he has an SFR and an HOA. Do you think the listing agent has the HOA and the condo and the HOA cert on it? Probably, Probably not. not. They don't have the latest meeting of the minutes. The HOA info is going to come 12 days after acceptance, if then. So By the he, way, this is your competition. These are just agents like, well, I'm going to write this up, and we're going to do this, and they're, telling their, they're telling their seller, like, we're going to do it this way, and when you, I'm going to protect you, and blah, 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 blah. It's like you don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> they, all they have to do is read the contract, and it says in there. That's why I say read the contract so you know it. It says in there everything that they just put in that counter doesn't mean anything anyway. That's why I'm like always like don't worry about it. It is so hard to pick a buyer out of escrow. Um, but if we stick to the contract, you know, and just protect our door fiduciary duty to our, the one we're representing, and that's why when we're on the listing side, make sure in that first five days you have everything out. Mm -hmm. You know, and what else do you have to do? You can't just send it. What else do you have to guys? What did you have to do? Confirm receipt. Yeah, confirm receipt. Do not, it could go to spam. You've got to confirm receipt. And make sure it's in writing because this could come up later. Does that make sense? Okay. Cool. So in this example on 15 days on items J2 and J3, they accepted a, financial, a, a loan. Mm -hmm. So even though the broker says 15 days, the loan didn't agree to that on J3. So does he have 15 days or really, because a lender didn't sign off on contingencies, he's still taking 21 days. Even if it says it in the RPA, does the bank agree to those 15 days? So that's also when you have a conversation with the lender, how fast can you get this done? You want to have that in the beginning, but um, the bank's not buying the property. Right. So it's the buyer taking the risk. It's up to the buyer to find the lending that can participate in that time frame. But under okay. RESPA, most banks have the extra three days. So they say, yeah, we can do it in 12. And do you guys understand anytime days. there's a change on the loan, they three must, days. there's add a three days. Yep. Every time. Add three days. I mean, that's why I say it is so hard to get a buyer out of escrow because then you'd have that log um, for you. So, okay, great, but you guys changed something in escrow. It's not my escrow. I didn't pick it. Now we have another three days. I can't, can't change the freaking law, right? And suck it up, buttercup. So then that covers him in the 15 days yep. of accepting it, covers which is the buyer. day three, right? Yeah. Okay. Perfect day for this class for you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't, yeah that, don't let that scare you. So do you have to take care of all these get postponed? If you agree to it, in the counter. If you agree to it. So you only do what you agree to, but know the contract, right? So let's say, and, and by the way, if I was a listing agent, I would always go back and shorten contingency period. Because I know, right? I know that there's always going to be these added times on, and I'm going to ask for a contingency removal. And we're going to get to where we can shorten the, the buyer to perform as well. But you've got to be on top of your game. That's why it's so important to make sure you have the right team in place. If you're trying to do everything yourself, something's going to fall through the crack, make sure you have a TC and you, and you have a checklist and you're going through it. Um, we have systems here. I don't know if you guys realize where it even shows you what date everything's due by. As soon as you, if you put it in the, in the system at the right time. So I loved that when I saw that. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool, right? The more uh, they dummy proof thing, the better it is for us. So we have way yeah. too many things going on, right? We have way too many things going on. Okay. So uh, loan contingency removal. This used to be 17 days. They've raised it to 21. A lot of that came after they changed the appraisal process. Mm -hmm. So we no longer pick our appraisals. Uh, back when I was in lending, we would pick the appraisal based on how fast they could get it back to us. So now that we have zero control over this, it just goes through a system and the appraisal is assigned, whatever. That's one of the reasons. Um, you need to be talking to your lender if you shorten this. If you're the listing agent, I would look at this. Um, 
to see if they change it for you, whatever. I usually, um, most lenders can get this done within 21 days of the approval process. Um, you want to, this is how you're going to find out how approved that buyer really is. Have they gone through underwriting? Have they handed in everything? Because um, a lender can um, give you a pre-qualification letter and a pre-approval letter based on the information a buyer put in on an app and on the phone, right? They have not given their W-2s, their tax returns, their 1099s, um, their bank statements, none of that. So once they actually go into process and it goes to underwriting, that's a whole other story. So you want to make sure that the approval is a good approval. And that's why if you're a buyer's agent, you want to make sure they're approved beforehand. And this is a good conversation with them because a lot of times people are afraid to have them do that. But look, you may seem like you are approved for something, but once it gets into the nitty gritty, they might see something that you pay or that you don't write off or whatever. And then it kills. Now, and I love this with married couples. Have the conversation with the husband, right? This is going to be a bad marriage. Right. If you, if your wife is now in love with this property, you're an escrow, and it turns out you can't buy it, you, you suck. Like you are not a good husband anymore, right? And it, it, it does, is that fair? Have that conversation with the husband. And go look. Be the hero. Be the hero. Do not go through this. So get it pre-approved the first time. The last thing you want to do is show them a home their wife falls in love with they can't afford. Yeah. You don't want to do that. And sometimes the wives are pretty, like if they have a good relationship, the wife's like, I am not even looking till I know what I can afford because I do not want to have this argument, <laughs> you know, and they know themselves. So have that conversation and don't be afraid of it. As a listing agent, what do you like to see there? What do you counter on the local I usually, um, just I'm pretty tough. No, I'll count. So we'll get to that. When we get, so I usually do all contingencies like that listing agent did. Um, all contingencies to be removed in this time. Not because I don't know how it works, more so because I want to see the reaction. I want to see who I have that's this whole class. Okay. <laughs> Don't ask that question. So no loan contingency. You can do that when you're cash. Um, if you're going to be doing a loan, I would never check it. I just wouldn't. Um, however, if you do no loan contingency, do you still have contingencies in place? Of course. Yeah. Your inspection, your um, review of documents, everything is still in place. Um, again, that's why uh, it's so funny. We had... Um, it, this was in LA and this is about a year ago I mean things it was like 15 offers on everything flying off and and because you know the average agent was doing only a couple transactions they weren't really that savvy and so I would tell the buyers agents I was like check all these things <laughs> you know I go and here's where all your contingencies lie so you still have 17 days you still have this you still have this because there's another area that's going to show you um, and but it may but to the listing agent that didn't has probably never read the contract thought that that buyer was a stronger buyer. When that buyer was the same exact buyer as every other buyer. It just appeared to them, it, it was the illusion and the way they viewed it, right? And that's why I like to be factual, be black and white. When we put a motion to interview it, oh, they have this off, they have this off. It's like, it doesn't even really exist. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Are you guys getting more from that? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Kirby Ellis used to use the example of a foot in the door. You just need one foot in the door to keep that door open. You just need so one foot. Contingencies are just a foot in the door, and you only need one. You only need one foot in the door. Yeah. You only need one foot in the door. Exactly. Keep it open. Love it. Okay. So this is where we're gonna. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so, um, so this. Oh my gosh. When you are a listing agent, please look for this, because what do most buyers agents forget to send you when they check it? The COP form, okay? So one time I caught, they sent it, they, it was checked, I knew to look. I caught it, I go, hey, you mind sending me the COP form? Because I need to see it. And they didn't send it, and guess why they didn't send it? House wasn't on the market, not falling for it, okay? So if you're not having this conversation and looking at it, because now it's going to tell me, is it an escrow, is it on the market, how long has it been on the market, what's the price of it, is it over -lifted? The COP is giving you all that information, and it's also talking about your contingency period of that contingency. Okay? I'm not saying don't take contingent offers, but in your counter, right, um, the buyer has this many days to release the contingency COP, right? Um, you can also put in there that you'll accept it on the terms of uh, if we get a non-contingent offer, 
they have they will have first right of refusal, but they have 72 hours to remove it. Mm -hmm. That's another way to do it. Okay. So they have a first right of refusal, but they only have 72 hours to figure it out. That is your best way to do it as a listing agent. Do not tie up your escrows with a contingent. You have to have that in there. Um, and then, because now they change the MLS where it's contingent, it's not um, pending until it's after contingencies. So you go, you're gonna get a lot of calls because people are still gonna write offers on that. Mm -hmm. Escrows fall out all the time, right? Can you explain that one more time? So it's um, 72 hours uh, first right of refusal. We'll have a 72 hour first right of refusal. At what point, when does that clock start? Um, if, the, if you receive, uh, once you receive another um, offer that seller is willing to accept price and terms, you know, they would have 72 hours to remove that contingency or buyer agrees to cancel escrow. Mm -hmm. Have that in there. Buyer agrees to cancel escrow. You have to have that extra step. Are you guys learning a lot more about your counters now? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. Stronger agent. That's okay. Just ask the question again. Now, can you see how you'll have less drama in your life and transactions? if you just do this ahead of time. Right. Get it done in the beginning. You hmm? said the last part, writer, uh, buyer refusal. Uh, First writer refusal. Yes, I got that part. And then you said, or buyer agrees to cancel, cancel escrow. escrow. Buyer agrees to cancel escrow. Okay, can you if they cannot remove, remove that contingency, uh -huh. buyer agrees to cancel escrow. Okay. Robin, in that situation, a lot of buyers have the money. So mm -hmm. in your counter offer to something of a COP accepted and they are not in the escrow, would you require the buyer possibly to be approved for this new financing and the previous? Yes. So here's the situation, which we'll be going over in uh, one of our next uh, meetings. Uh, there's a lot of, and we have it with Sturm, which a lot of people don't realize that there's a lot of, it has no prepayment penalty. Um, good rates, all this, we have bridge financing. Yes. So where you can get, um, if you have a house on the property, it's short term, we have two loans, financing on this other one. So it, there's all different ways. Um, you know, obviously if this is a great buyer and you really want, you know, you're working with each other, you're working with, it, then again, communication. So buyer agent, call listing agent, they love this home, I've shown them, you know, play on emotion. I have shown them 98 homes. <laughs> this is the one. We're making this happen. We are making this happen, right? <laughs> and that's when you play on the, the agent's emotions. Send them gifts. Send them flowers. Looking forward to escrow. Go on their Facebook. Looking forward to opening escrow with you. You know, make them feel like the bad, right? you got to farm the agent, too. You can't just farm your client. So go in there and just go, here's the situation. They are contingent. We are in, uh, Give them this situation. We are approved for bridge financing. Because you oh. don't want to scare them. And if you don't have the communication, which... It, it, that's nine times out of ten why an, um, a multiple offer does not get picked is because the agent didn't have communication with the other agent and they didn't tell their story yeah. and that's why because mm -hmm. do you want to go to escrow with an agent that didn't even pick up the phone and call you and tell you the offer was coming no. god it's going to be awful right mm -hmm. happens all the time and when you do that what's the first thing a lot of people think of multiple offers they're putting offers on a lot of properties right. This could fall out. Yeah. And then that's all a good conversation to have with your buyer when you meet mm -hmm. with them in the buyer consultation. Is you yeah. say, as a listing agent, do you think it's important for the, the selling agent that's representing the buyer to communicate well and effectively mm -hmm. with the sell with the listing agent? Exactly. And then you can just say, like, how confident are you that, that someone you're gonna be choosing is gonna communicate efficiently and effectively to that listing agent? Exactly. And then that's when you can also share a little you can share a little bit about you. Again, don't make it too much about you. Um, but one of the things I always talk about and coach about is how important agent to agent relationships are and, and how much I made my career about being friends with agents, which is why I had to work even harder because I, I had no SOI that wasn't <laughs> real estate agents, right? Um, so I'm like, I, I the only friends I have are realtors. Um, but it was always good because my, my offer would get accepted or and people would show my, my listings because they knew I was going to be friendly, right? Even, even Paul, which by the way, total nice guy. When I moved to LA, you know, he sent me a message asking me if I needed help moving. We never worked at the same company. Oh. Yeah, but we uh, the agent to agent relationships. Remember? Yeah. I'm you remember that. I That's remember. Funny. I absolutely remember. Absolutely remember. You always remember nice things, right? And women, we remember everything. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But you know, I mean, but that's like that's that's respect. Yeah. That's respect. Now. If I had a listing 
would he, he would always feel comfortable calling me on it. If he had a listing, I would always feel comfortable calling him on it, right? Agent to agent relations are huge. So my point is to you, Shane and Pearl, is like I belong to these networking groups and I, and I have a lot of agent to agent relationships. Reason I do that is because I want to make sure that we have the relationships to begin with so that I can call and get the insider information. And so the right. offer ends up at the top of the pile. Your offer will end up on the top of the pile. I have so many people that will call me and go, do you know this agent? I'm like, I actually do. Can you call them? <laughs> I want my offer accepted. They have, five, they have five offers. And I'm always happy to do it. It's like, oh, sure, I'll give them a call. Or I'll say, you don't want to work with that agent. <laughs> you know? It depends on what it is. OK. And so in here, you always want to make sure you're checking things. So backup offer addendum. Um, if, you're, if you know already that it's going to be a backup offer because it's an escrow, make sure you include your backup offer addendum, okay? Um, and it's in, all these things are in wind form. So septic well on property, if you have one of these, can you make sure you, you do it here? Um, listing agent will probably provide it anyway, but just, just click the box that you're requesting it because sometimes it, it's not required that they give it to you if you know they have a septic tank. And this is the funniest thing is people think this is not in Orange County. Oh, yeah, it is. I had a septic tank. I did not know I had one until it went out. Then you know. <laughs> right? So oftentimes in Laguna, Dana Point, San Clemente, and some places in Newport, um, when the houses are on slopes and they're built onto the slope, you have a pl a one plumbing up here. Down here is a whole other different plumbing. And that can sometimes be on a septic tank. Did you guys know that? Yep. Yeah, so make sure, and by the way, I want to let you know that the listing agent may not know that it has a septic tank. So you need to know these things too. Ask them, yeah, seller would know. Seller would know. Well, sometimes like I didn't know, right? And it was never disclosed to me when I bought the property. I'm wondering if the owner knew. No, which is bad because you could have had that inspected. I could have had it inspected, exactly. But however, should my home inspector have caught it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? He probably did. I was married to someone that was not... Handy. Okay. So, <laughs> um, all right. So, short sale addendum. This is very important. There's going to be a lot of timelines in there. Anytime you're doing a short sale, make sure you include that. Again, in the counter offer, the listing agent will probably, and when you are the listing agent, look at the short sale addendum. I would always counter it with the short sale addendum I put in place and picked my own time frames. Okay. So make sure you're reading it, and if, it's, if it goes with what you're, you want to do. If not, provide your own. Addendum one, this is also, you make sure you catch this. Addendum one, sometimes buyer's agents, savvy buyer's agents, will send this over and forget to put the addendum in there. And the addendum was the good stuff for their buyer, right? The addendum was like, seller to pay this. And you, and you totally accepted this offer with addendum one without even looking at it. You must look here, okay? And you have to call. Where's addendum one? And it could have been an accident, who knows? This could have been a template from an um, um, offer they put in before on another property. You have no idea. So just make sure you're reading it. Court confirmation, that's if you know it needs it, like if it's a probate, right? Um, bankruptcy, divorce, that's where you get in the, um, anybody know of any other examples of a court confirmation? Trust. Trust. What else? Anyone else? Sometimes in foreclosure when it's private parties or liens, you might need court confirmation. Or HOA less pendants in the HOA. Yeah, any kind of uh, less pendants, you might need that. So uh, the most common is going to be probate, bankruptcy, um, and that's usually when it's a, a Chapter 13. Okay. Um, and then also a... Um, uh, because one thing you need to know too, if they're in a chapter 13 bankruptcy, do you guys understand that's like a, they're doing a loan so it's for five years. So if they were to go to sell their house within that five year period, they need to have that approved by the court still. So know, know that going in, okay. Um, and then also if it's a, um, sometimes in divorce, um, <laughs> I've seen, <laughs> yay, this was fun. Um, <laughs> I've seen one person, like it might, the other person might not have ever gotten on title because it was the loan was just in the husband's name. They didn't put so they didn't quit claim it to where it was both of them. This is a common thing that happens in Orange County. Wife doesn't know any different, and um, the husband tries to sell it out from under. Ooh. 
right? Um, don't get in the middle of that. Just make sure you know if they're going through divorce. You can also look up and see. So if it says on title, this is a good thing for you to know. If it says on title, married man or married woman, so on separate, because that's what it would say if they did it, uh, if they went, um, got the loan on their own. Usually what happens after that is they quit claim the spouse on it, and it's like community property, site rights, all that kind of stuff. So when they, it's usually so on separate for a few reasons. One, they got the loan by themselves and qualified. Maybe the wife had bad credit or maybe the husband had better, whatever the reason is. Or they have, this person has three loans in their name, this person has two loans in their name, whatever that is. Um, that's one reason. Another reason might be that it might be a property that they had prior to this marriage. And it's part of their prenup or whatever. It's not included in the assets that they have together. That's also another reason. But you have to get to the bottom of it. So when you go to the <laughs> listing agreement, uh, you must ask them, is there anybody else that would have claims to the property? I know that your whole title is married, man, sold, and separate. Um, is, are, you, are you currently married? And is your wife going on this as well? You have to have the conversation. Okay? Because you don't want to get in the middle of um, divorce courts. And if they're like, well, I filed for divorce. Do I need to talk to an attorney? Your attorney. Um, what's going on? You've got to find this stuff out. And it happens all the time. Orange County especially. Actually, it really, really does. Um, so, um, other, what can you put there? On the trust, mm -hmm. if, if, the, if the house that you're going to be listing is in a trust, you have to get court confirmation? You don't have to, okay. but sometimes. Um, Sometimes. So what if you're dealing with the person that's on, it's their trust, then you don't have to. You just need to get, escrow will also get a copy of the trust. You need to find out what the, what the terms are. Okay. Um, sometimes if the trust is like is someone, uh, there's someone that died in the trust, like it depends on what the trust is. Mm -hmm. um, also, if someone's at agreement of the trust. Um, it, but usually when it's in a trust, it's pretty clean. Okay. That's why it's in a trust mm -hmm. and doesn't go to probate, right? So people should be putting their properties in trust so, to avoid probate right. and, and save their kids the, the nightmare. Right. And then you have that. to get a trust advisory if, if it is. Yes. Yeah. You get a trust Always, advisory. even with your listing agreement. You have even to have with your listing list, agreement. You have to have them sign that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. The trustees of their own trust. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. On the buyer's side, Robin, the CCA, what mm -hmm. happens if you see something something funky on title, it's a multiple offer situation again under 500. As the buy that's really not the business of the buyer's agent. That's a further disclosure down the line so don't rattle the cage at that point. It depends. So I mean, how do you put your let's say you saw a lot of liens on there yeah. or a list pendants. I, I would call the list agent and go, hey, I just noticed when I went to write this, I noticed when I was confirming the assessor partial number, I noticed it had, or you notice that the lien is like more than the purchase price, you know, it's a short sale or what you just try to find out the information. Just go, is there anything to be concerned about? You know, what's the situation and have the conversation. Usually if you even call, um, you don't even have to bring that up. If you, uh, you'll find out ahead of time what kind of listing agent you're, going, you know, you're working with too. Um, and you can also call title because a lot of times what it says on real list at title, they'll have, well, this one was taken off, this one was taken off. So I would call title, dig a little deeper first. Call the listing agent, go, hey, I'm going to write up an offer. Is there anything I need to know? And ask at that time. Um, if you think the listing agent's newer or, like, out of the area, they may not know. Sometimes they don't pull up a prelim until they go into escrow. You should always pull up a prelim before you take the listing, right? It's, like, so easy to get them now within 24 hours. So um, you want because you want to know what's going on. Are the liens on it? Does that have a mechanics lien? You know, is there anything you can get off for it? Um, sometimes mechanics lien, if it's gone, I think it's over two years and it hasn't been paid uh, in a certain amount, you can actually get it off the property. So um, there's, and there was no action taken, you can get it, so you actually will be a hero to the, to the seller, right? Um, so there's a lot of these little ins and outs, and title knows that. So call title first, is there anything I need to know, is there anything recorded on here recently? Um, it doesn't always show up on Realist, do not trust it, okay? Makes sense? So on other, uh, you want to hit that if you're putting in another um, document that, um, you know, may not be on here as a choice, so anything in wind forms that you're adding to that, and just put it in there. Statewide buyer and seller advisory. I know it's a pain, but now they've made it a little bit better that now you only sign the last page, 
right? <laughs> so I think they caught on. I check it. I check it just to cover yourself. My theory, if it exists and it's on the form, get it. Okay, because it exists for a reason. It exists for a reason. These forms exist due to lawsuits. Okay, so just why not? I mean, who cares? It's one more signature. You know, statewide buyer and seller advisory. I mean, why not give them that? Um, and, and does anyone have anything to say about that, or do you agree? Or and some, I think our office requires. Does our office require it, Jeter? Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 Some some don't anymore because. Yeah, some don't. We do. Yes. Okay. No, no. Do they require it for before closing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So if I were the broker, I would require it for the file. So we still require it. Is it um, always required according to the BRE? I don't. I, I actually don't think it is anymore. I don't know. I, I just would just do it. Just do it. Um, you don't have to do it at the time, but have it checked. Okay, I usually don't send, if I have it checked, I don't send it with the offer because then the listing agent's like, oh, God, yeah, yeah. you know. However, you check that you want it. Okay, that's part of the battle. Just check that you want it. So when you're, when you're the listing agent going through, you know that regardless if your brokerage, because I've gotten in kind of arguments before with the other agent, my brokerage doesn't require it. Great, good for you. It's checked in the purchase agreement, provide it. Yeah, if you don't want to sign the one page now that they made it easier for you, please put refuse to sign. Why? It's yeah. a great document for mm -hmm. the buyer or seller who's going to actually read it. Exactly. Because everything that's in that is stuff that they Google all day long. And then you get like the real stuff. Yeah, right. it's like a pamphlet. It's not cancer. Yeah. Right, yeah. exactly. It's like handing them a buyer seller pamphlet. Right. Always tell them, like, you read this. Now, would that be a really cool thing to have in your buyer yeah. book? <laughs> I'm giving you all your stuff, guys. Okay. So, uh -huh. so in one of the PowerPoint classes, one of the managers stated that he doesn't check anything except that buyer's inspection advisory at this point. He requests all of that during the due diligence process. Okay. Because so, in multiple kind of offer situations, a listing agent could get overwhelmed. And just you could just deal with that later. Okay. No offense to your teacher, but that was dumb advice. Okay. So um, <laughs> it it will cover you later. And the reason why this comes from experience. Okay. So there are brokerages out there and smaller brokerages that do not require this for your file. And you're dealing with egos. They will argue and not provide it to you. And you want it. Yeah. I didn't ask it for it. You don't have to provide it with the offer. You just ask for it. It's part of the. So when it's a contract, it's now part of the contract. So I would always check it and never provide it at the time just because it is like 10, 12 more pages. Um, however, it's always checked so that you know that you have to get it at some point. Yeah. Well, then, because I thought we were taught too on the other way, we would do the MCA, the first team disclosures, the a ABA, and the BSA. Because that's mm -hmm. how we were taught to put those in there as well. I always do the MCA. I actually always do the MCA. Do. Thank you. Um, so under other, they have two places for other. That is one thing. Um, and you learn this if you've gone through the short sale market back in the day. Um, why does the MCA form exist? Lawsuits, market conditions advisory, right? So um, there was a lawsuit, I think this is back in 2003 or 2004, it actually bankrupted the broker. Um, he was sued because, I remember back in 2003, the market was like, next week, you're in escrow and next week it's 100 grand more, the property value. But you're in escrow. And you agreed to this price. And that's where the value was that day. However, 10 more were on the market, and it's bidding more, bidding more, bidding more, and this person got this. Well, you don't find out until after your close. It's not really a comp yet. And that seller sued the broker because they blamed the broker basically for not having to put the ball. And knowing that book, they said that they cost them 100 grand because this other house, a month or two later, closed for a hundred grand more. And whether or not, you must understand that, whether or not it was valid, legal, whatever, we're in the most litigious state. That broker still had to pay to defend themselves. So they and that's what, and it kills your business, it kills your, your mindset, you know, everything, because it's drama, and they're scared, 
and they're not able to focus on their business anymore. And now they're paying lawyers over something very frivolous and we have no control of the market. So I would always do other, put an MCA in there and do a market conditions advisory. That is something actually I would always provide with every offer. Um, yeah, and also I would do it with every listing agreement too. I think it's in the listing agreement. They, they give you an option to grab that. So um, because the listing people need to know when you have those conversations, hey, you're going to chase the market down if you don't price it right and give them market decision advisory, this could, the market gets to change. The market, I don't get to pick it. <laughs> yeah. It gets to change. I just want to let you know, and I'm going to advise you of that right now and, and have them read that. Um, there's also some new forms I saw in there that I thought was great and lovely, and I wish they existed a long time ago. Um, a seller, uh, I forget exactly what it's called, but going against broker's advice. They actually have forms now to protect you that you can send over. Just want to let you know, I've advised you of this. You are you are choosing not to listen to me. Like to get a pre-inspection before you list, a termite report before you list, listing and price before you list. Listing price. You choose not to listen to me. Yeah. You choose to take this offer even though this, this, and this. You choose not to listen to me. Don't see me later. Basically is what it's for. And it has the same one for a buyer too. So, um, yeah, go through your win form sometimes and just check out all the forms. And Lots of new ones in there. Letters that are available in the library are mm -hmm. Lots of them. Lots of them. Okay, so REO advisory when it's a bank owned property? Never. You don't have <laughs> Not one. anymore. If there ever was one, you would need that. Um, be advised and look at the advisory because it'll say on there too. If you are putting an offer in on an REO, because it could they could come up later, um, an REO property, make sure your buyer knows that they're not they're going to get the disclosures and the disclosures going to have a big stamp on it that says what? Don't know, don't ask. Seller exempt. Right. They don't know anything, right? It's now going to be up to you and buyer. Really up to buyer. You can you can assist them. I would do diligence really up to the buyer to find out. Um, one of the things I found out in REO one is I knocked on the, because I wanted to ask the neighbors, I wanted to help them out. We were doing our home inspection. I knocked on the neighbor's doors. Can you tell me anything about this property? I noticed, um, the inspector noticed like this, this gate leaning. They thought maybe from leak, was there a leak? Like, no, you know, it's pretty good. It was just, there was a sprinkler that was left on once, blah, blah, blah. And you know, pretty good, other than that, um, you know, the guy that died. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, God. And he's like, oh, is there a murder or anything? You know, like, and like, I'm just like, okay. So then I go up to, I now know. So it's kind of like, yeah. do you really want to be the one that knocks on the door? Um, mistake on my part, okay? However, I, in hindsight, I was doing the right thing too, like integrity-wise, right? So because would I, if, they, if that was the same for them, would I want them to continue? No. Would they blame you? Yes. Who should have knocked on the door though? The buyer. The buyer. The buyer should have knocked on the door. Um, so mistake, that was a mistake on my part, lesson learned, because I put myself in a position, and I don't know the details. So, I had, so what I did is I gave them all material facts at that point. And I went to them and I said, hey, I want to let you know, I just talked to the neighbor. I am recommending that you talk to the neighbor, and I will Google the address. that you do it too. I can call the um, police and see if there was any police report regarding it, but there was a death on the property. And, and the husband goes... And then the wife was a nurse, actually, and um, and it's a bank of property. And the husband goes, uh, was it, or the wife goes, was it a murder? I go, no, I think it was natural causes. She goes, and the husband husband goes, am I getting a good deal? <laughs> I said, yeah. yes, you are. Yeah. And and the husband just looks at me, and goes, I don't want to know which room. <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> and that was that. So I was like, okay. However, I disclosed it. And at that time, what did I also? <laughs> I need to put in writing that they are aware. Yes. Because that is a conversation. And now there's a conversation they weren't a party to, which was what? Me and the neighbor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Let's say they now decide, she never told us that. Neighbor says, I told her. Okay, so is that just... Where are you putting that information? And I've learned the hard way on that one, where I told someone something verbally, they later said, no, she didn't. Mm -hmm. When I know he knows, but it's not in writing. 
And so uh, are you putting that just in writing in a, in a journal for that, that no. transaction? No. Um, you can do an addendum. I would, or you can just write up something, additional disclosure. Okay. During our due diligence period, uh -huh. it was found, a material fact was realized that there was a death of property. Buyer agrees that they acknowledge this information and they are okay with moving forward with the purchase. Yeah. Okay. And you can talk to your legal counsel if you need to worry anything different. Mm -hmm. um, there actually may be disclosure in wind farms regarding a death on property too. And I know it's in your seller property questionnaire, and it's also in the um, the TDS, I believe, as well. Um, however, this, the bank is going to be exempt. Yeah. So this is another thing a lot of you in this room is not going to know. That another person that's going to be exempt of giving this information. So if it's a flip and a, a corporation or LLC is selling the property, they, and they bought it knowing there was death on the property, they went in, fixed it, flipped it, they don't have to disclose it. Because they've never lived on the property? Is that right? Or just... Mm -hmm. Also, if it's an investor who is renting it out, yeah. they don't have to... Well, they don't have to disclose it. Why? Because they didn't live there? Mm -hmm. The why, I don't know. I just know they don't have to. So it's probably in the disclosure, right? You know, to be honest, I mean, I don't want to give, again, I don't want to give you the information. Um, they just don't, they don't have to disclose it. So again, what you want to do is you want to educate the buyer going into it. An investor signed the property. They've only owned it for this amount of time. They flipped it. In a flip situation, although they have received all the disclosures from when they bought it, this company does not have to disclose everything to us. All material facts will not be there. So this is what I'm going to recommend. You also have the forms and wind forms, which I would recommend and everything, where like, you advise all these inspections and they need to check which ones they're doing, which ones are not, and sign off on that. Okay? And also, um, the best way to do this is, and this is what you can offer up, the best way to do this is to go knock on doors and ask the neighbors. And you might get a buyer that's freaking out. Like, I don't want to knock on doors. Would you like me to go with you? I knock on doors all the time and upset people, right? So you can go with them. However, I would never do it without them from experience. But, and, and by the way, it was okay. It turned out okay. And these were people I knew and the really good people and friends and all of that. However, when I go back as a coach and a trainer, I'm like, ooh, that was a bad thing. I, and I wasn't expecting that. And a great learning experience, glad it happened, because I'm like, oh, that's the thing everyone tells you of why you don't do that, because you might find out that, <laughs> right? So it's okay the buyer, you want to help the buyer alone, let them find out, don't find out on your own. Because well, this is when they're going to find out this stuff, is when they talk to the neighbors. Yes. When they move in. They're going to find out when they move in. Exactly. Or when they show up prior to close the school with their entire family, and they're standing in the cul-de-sac, and they're mm -hmm. the neighbors, and the neighbors Oh, you're Did right. you hear? Right. Yeah. The suit. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're buying the suicide house. Yeah. So, so Gary, he has a similar um, sense of humor as me, right? And he'll always tell people, they're like, well, is there bad neighbors? Like, well, there are, but the people that own the house will be gone. You know, so he's always jokes around that. So, um, find out, too, if there are. Like, it is good for them to find out. It's not a lease, you guys, it's not a car. It's a house. Find out if it does have, um, why are they moving? Um, does it have bad neighbors? There is a place on the um, SPQ and also on the TDS where they're supposed to disclose if there is a nuisance, yeah. right? Um, and that would include, when you are a listing agent, that would include traffic noise, even if it's obvious, okay? You don't know what their hearing's like. You need to, you need to disclose that, even if it's obvious. That would also include there is a yapping chihuahua that is out eight hours of the day. If I were going to buy a house and there were a yapping dog next door that's out a lot, I would want to know, yeah. right? I like having my windows open. That would drive me mad, yeah. you know? If there's, um, if the neighbors are next door, they have kids and they constantly, balls are constantly in your yard mm -hmm. and they're always knocking on your door to get the ball and you're a private person because there's a lot of people that don't like kids, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I'm not that person. However, I don't think I'd want to like answer my door every 20 minutes to get a ball. I would probably knock on the door. Hey, heard your balls are always coming in my yard. Here's a key to the gate. <laughs> you know, get it yourself. You know, uh, or get a really big dog. I don't know. So, um, but you know, you just want to know that going in. 
And, and by the way, is that a solution? Because if they're like, well, I don't want to be bothered all the time. Okay, great. I heard they're really nice. Why don't you go meet them? Um, offer them a key to the gate or something. Because they're, they're trying to be respectful by knocking on your door and not going in your backyard. Maybe you can just tell them it's okay to go back there if your ball goes in there. That's, and, and that used to be an okay thing to do, to go in someone's backyard and get the ball and it went in there, and now people shoot you. So, um, yeah, growing up, remember when you go up, you get away, you just jump in, you grab it, and you leave? Yeah. And you can't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, just jump the fence. Like everyone, there were no, yeah, there were no fences. Um, okay, so probate advisory, when it's a probate, trust, when it's trust, short sale information advisory again. I would always do both. Uh, make sure if it's short, just ask for your buyer's sake. Other terms, this is where you can hide some things. What would we hide here? Buyer to pay 3% of seller's closing costs. Um, I reversed an idea. Right, so, uh, so you reversed it. So, <laughs> that's seller, what I did yeah. in this market. Right, exactly, exactly. So seller, if it, if it was like mm. seller to pay this, but you're like saying buyer, right? So you would want to put it here because sometimes the listing agent's going to go fast because they're excited they got an offer. Right? So this is when the, um, they got an offer, they got an offer, they see everything else, they might not check it. They might catch this, right? Um, also, other things that you put in there is... Um, all flat screens included. In all flat screens included. All out of the ordinary things you want to put in there. What else would you put in there? Get creative. I'd say all flat screens included, serial number 123, picture on addendum 1. Oh, that? that? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to give you another one that you're not saying. That is really good to put in there. And they, they've changed the contract to make it good to put in there. Refer to Right? Sell it to pay section one and two of termite. Oh, that's what we put it? That's Hold where, on. Yeah. How come yeah. you don't put that on seven? Go down to seven on you report. Can, however, and then in the other, on you're hiding it, right? So this is savvy. We're talking about savvy when I'm on, right? So I'll tell you different places to put it. This is another place you can. Again, it's a contract. It's what you need to do as a listing agent. Look for these kind of things because that's where. And by the way, old school agents aren't used to the new contract. They may put it there just out of not knowing where to put it. Mm. Okay, you can't assume that the agent's trying to be savvy. They may just not know where to put it. This is a new contract. Have you ever had someone, like, they've been in real estate 20 years but haven't really worked much in it, and all of a sudden their brother, sisters, um, whatever, 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 wants to buy something, they write up a contract, and they didn't realize it's changed four times? Like, they have no idea. They're looking for the WPA. Like, they don't know. So they're like, oh, I can't find it. I'm just going to write it here because that's where we always wrote things for what, 15 years? That's where we wrote everything that was additional. Um, anytime, we put this, that, or the other. Um, this is also we can write in uh, per diem. Mm -hmm. As dam. well as the private loan, too. You can. Other terms. Other terms can be anything. You can. Yeah. What else? Anybody got any other ideas? All parties are aware that buyer has a California real estate broker's license, real estate license, whatever. Oh, is this, this also be uh, related to buyer? Mm -hmm. to All parties are aware buyer is related to agent. That's right. Okay. Do you realize when they have a real estate license or a broker's license, you must disclose it? Yeah. You're supposed to. Yeah. Make sure you're doing that. And this is where you'd put it, right here. What else? For a VA buyer, buyer is aware that earnest money deposit is refundable as loan is a zero down loan, but all other service fees occurred to buyer will be in permissible. Yeah. Basically anything, it's a contract. Any Anything in real estate, this is on some writing. This is a contract. So any other terms you want to put in there, but it's got to be in writing, it has to be here. Okay. So um, a, a lot of different things uh, you could put in here is um, uh, all parties are aware that uh, this is subject to um, ex-wife or soon-to-be ex-wife. You know, I mean, you, yeah. could, you could have all these things in there or um, 
a settlement or buyer receiving settlement payment by this time or this is where you'd put it in there. So as a listing agent, don't overlook this lovely yummy area, especially when you're getting a, um, something from an agent that has been in the business forever because they're not going to classes because they're above it. They don't need to learn anything new. They know everything, oh, yeah. right? They've never seen their contract completely. They, they really, and especially the ones that if you see everything handwritten, oh yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I can't even read it. Yeah. So um, be aware. Okay. So all account, allocation of costs. This is where things even get more fun. Um, inspection reports, certifications. Uh, normally, it is seller shall pay natural hazard zone disclosure report. Okay. One thing that you know you can add environmental other. One thing that I usually would add in there, but it's not, some disclosure report services will offer it, and this is sometimes how you can win the service provider. Uh, it's not something I think a lot of insurance companies are providing anymore. I would always also ask for a clue report. Yeah. A what? A clue report. So not many times will the listing agent even counter it out. Because they don't know. They don't know what it is. They don't know what it is. They think the NHD company is going to provide it. And this is a, you're adding a contingency. Um, because it's more difficult now for people to provide you a clue report. Do you guys, do you guys know that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's now going to be up to the seller, which they should, provide you with a clue report. It's also sometimes your insurance company that you're trying to get insurance from as a buyer, um, they're unable to pull a correct clue report. So you really do want it. Okay, so I would ask, I would ask for it. And if you have a savvy listing agent, they may know. I would know. I would say, hey, I don't know if I can come up with a clear report, car insurance company. <laughs> I'm not going to agree to it. If I can get it, great. If I can't, it's on you. Where would you go to get a clear report? Insurance, insurance company. There are, um, but there's, the reason I tell you this is there's a lot of, this is why you should know your NHD reps and ask them what they provide, as a listing agent especially. A lot of NHD companies no longer provide it. They can call their insurance company and get it. Yeah. I mean, why should you do more work when they can just get it themselves? However, do you guys understand, I just gave you a five-day contingency. Right. This is the one thing you're not going to ever get because they're going to forget. Okay, again, we're talking about being savvy. So, buyer as a buyer's agent, you're going to add other. You're going to add clear report. I'd always add environmental because you want to know that, especially like Laguna, right? I gave you a slide down a hill. Um, have you ever tried to get land slide insurance? You can get it in areas that don't have land slides. Right. <laughs> Super weird. Okay, so. I would always ask for clear report. They, at the very end, when you go to ask contingencies, okay, great, I'm going to remove everything except for the clear report. We didn't get that yet. Can you provide it? Five days. It's going to take them two to get it. Right? Seven days. Just about a week. So I'm helping you as a buyer's agent do that. That's a contingency. Does that help? You guys getting like yeah. some... Fun little things. Who's it prepared by? The insurance company? Or so, you say? usually, some NHD companies provide it. They're able to pull it, but usually it's an insurance company that pulls it's it. It's not. It's a five. You guys know what a clear report is? Yeah. No. Okay, so some don't know. So, it's a five year history of the home on if there was any insurance claims. Okay. Yeah, so kind of like when you do car facts reports on cars, yeah. was it in an accident, <laughs> right? Um, you're going to, why sometimes you may not want to report your accident, if it's only $500 to fix your car, do you want to claim it on your insurance? No. No, because it follows the car, uh, right? Diminishes the, diminishes the value of the car because it's going to have your Carfax report. And by the way, I'm not giving, because this is being taped, I'm not giving you advice at all. These are just things I've heard through the years. Okay, so, um, <laughs> but, uh, but then on a house, you want to know if there was an insurance claim, especially um, have you had, ever had a, a client with copper plumbing? I had a copper pinhole link in, in a home that I owned, and it was a $79,000 claim. Yeah. And I didn't know because I lived in this big home by myself at that point. My assistant found it in a spare bedroom. They're like, you know, your wood floors kind of look like a roller coaster. <laughs> and it had been going on for God knows how long, but a pinhole leaked through and, you know, just killed all the wood floors. Wood floors are now not being made anymore. Entire house is that wood. 
right? So now then all the baseboards and all the paint, like everything, it was just best thing that ever happened, right? So you like, you like, you want a pinhole leak sometimes. You're like, oh, free remodel. Um, however, it's going to go with the house. Yeah. Now, something that you guys should also know when this stuff happens, and this is why I ask, because you want to ask, did they replumb the house? Yeah. Or did they do, um, yeah, everything else? Because here's the situation. If you have one pin, copper pinhole leak, because it happened yeah. to me, the second one came, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's a common thing. How old is the house? The other thing you need to know is insurance doesn't pay to replumb. Oh. So when you're making an offer and they have not replumbed, take that $20,000 into consideration. Mm -hmm. Great, we want to take, uh, we want a $20,000 credit for plumbing. Or we want this, or we want that, or, or whatever. Because can you check all the plumbing inside the walls? No. You can't, unless you're going to go inside the wall. Right, which I actually did have a buyer do once. Mm -hmm. Like they're like, you know, because a leak happened while in escrow. They're like, we want to open the wall. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> I would too, <laughs> you know. And you fix it, but you get to open the wall. So you want to make sure they know that. Also, who else does not pay for all the plumbing? Home warranty. Home warranty. Home warranty. Oh. You need to know those things about your home warranties too. It's going to be they will pay for something, but it's going to be up to a limit, usually fifteen hundred, eighteen hundred, twenty two hundred. Okay, plumbing's expensive. Uh huh. So what's a good leverage to put in contra offer if I seller agent you want to come to If you're the listing agent and they ask for it, um, that was taken into consideration when we listed the property and the price already. Property is being sold as is, as stated in the contract. You know every home in California is sold as is and it's in the contract. It's uh -huh. in the contract. It's in the contract, okay. Make sure your buyer knows that going in. But when you're getting homeowner's insurance, you automatically get a clue report. There's mm -hmm. a double entendre with that that you're setting yourself up for like the REO, mm -hmm. which is if you get a clue report, let's say you have an open, it's an open on a flood claim, but they were evacuated like they are right now for, for flood and they decided to take a trip down to San Diego and stay in the hotel for a week, it's just called an open flood claim or, right? and something like that. Do you risk doing that, though? And I saw this in the last couple of years that insurance sees your clue and not their clue they mm -hmm. pulled up, the buyer's insurance. It's a disclosure, and they, they charge them now a higher rate. So here's the deal. If I was... I would pay the higher rate. If I was a buyer's agent, I would recommend knowing as much as you possibly can. If I was a listing okay. agent, I would only disclose what you know. And then how do you do geo in slide areas? Does that come up on Clue also, or is that more... You, you want to do it, um, you want to have a, a geo inspection. Right. Oh, anytime you're on a, a hillside, um, they're like eight, I, well, they were back when I would do them, they were 800 some dollars, or probably $1,500 now. It's worth every penny. You want to know if it's going to slide down the hill. <laughs> but there's not a because you're BK and if that goes down the hill and there's no more land, right? Because nothing's covering that. It's right. either a loss you walk, or you, you, a lot of people end up in bankruptcy. So yeah. You want to try to get the seller to pay for that. That's what I was asking. The eight hundred dollars. You can, you can. We'll get to that when we talk about inspections. You can. So if it was like a Laguna thing. Yeah, if, if, a lot of times when you're, by the way, when you're working with buyers at that time, you go into, like, let's say they're buying a $10 million property, you should be having the conversation before, and it's not going to be a sweat off their back. Um, uh, inspection, you're going to do about 5,000 inspections. Oh. Okay. And That's normal. Association, too, on the plumbing. A lot of yeah, a lot of it's condos. Oh, my God, San Clemente, there was one there. They had to come and redo all the plumbing. By the way, the association would come in and do redo the plumbing, However, the buyer should know if they want to deal with it, right? They have to know that going in. And these are the, another reason why you really need to know about the plumbing. They may have fixed the hole. They may have fixed the cosmetic stuff on the outside. Um, could there be mold all through the, the walls? Certainly. And black mold and respiratory problems, right? So um, you need to know that too. Because that, that mold, how long, it, it takes less than a day to grow. You don't know, and you don't know if it was, um, sometimes they just put bleach on it and call it a day. You have no idea what they did to repair that. Um, it, the real way to repair it is that they had a mold person come in, did they do the air test? Because um, they, if they don't remove the boards, they're not removing the mold. Cleaning the mold is not gonna remove it. Okay, and I'm not a mold inspector. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> 
And lunch will be here soon, just late. I think. Did, uh, as Allie come, oh, she already delivered it. Okay, so we'll finish this page in lunch, okay? Um, okay, so. Yay, right? <laughs> oh my God, my okay, so this is a place where we have the season agents. Don't get excited yet. I didn't say lunch now after this page. Oh. Okay, so this is where the season agent, um, where we should put the termite, termite yeah. where we don't. There's another place you can also put termite as well. Um, so this is seller shall pay for the following report. Termite, prepared by, what do you put there? A licensed and license. bonded trust company. company. Yeah, so you can either put the one by your choice. Or and, and I can and I can give you an argument for that too. If you actually do have a, a termite company that you really want to support because they support you, you put them in there. And this and I can tell you objection handlers for it. But um, I would put any. Uh, what I would only put there's any licensed bonded um, and, and insured uh, one. And I actually usually put in reputable, any reputable licensed bonded because there's a lot of licensed bonded termite people out there that are just awful. You know, not very reputable. Never show up. You know, Yelp reviews, whatever. So um, this is also a place where sometimes they don't notice. You can put seller um, shall pay for the following thing. You can also include right here termite. Uh, you can put seller to pay for the following. Um, uh, it, this is where you would put buyer um, home inspection report or any home inspection reports. You can sneak in seller shall pay for the following report. Geo. They don't always catch it. If I were going to do that, I would do it up here and put down here. Because mm. the way the brain thinks, you're only going to see the termite. Okay? By the way, you're just being savvy. You're not trying to be sneaky. 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 Right. You are being a good agent, though, for, for your client. This is where you would put it. Um, and it also gives you the, another explanation to explain to the buyer, this is what the reports that you should be doing. And these are what you are responsible for paying for. So you don't have that problem moving forward. And this is how much they are. And this is a list of people that you can call. Um, you can also, this is, you can sneak in there because it's part of the contract, prepared by any license, whatever, seller to pay for section one and two. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just for section two also? Wow. If it's in the contract, you can sneak it through if they don't find it. Yeah, depending on the situation. If you know, okay, there are times when you might want to ask for section two. There's a lot of detached woodwork, right? And you know it's rotted. When you looked at that property, or there's a detach, um, a casita, some anything that there's detached or the wood, um, like you know how the fence is in between the yards mm -hmm. and the backwoods, and that that's a section two item. Section two item, okay. How about decks on the side? And the, of the decks, deck? decks for sure. View decks. View decks. Yeah, you want them to do that, okay. So, not everything. <laughs> But did you guys learn anything? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A lot more savvy when they can oh, now. So yes. Good. Okay. Cool. Know what to look for. Mm -hmm. Now, have you have, be honest? Has anyone found something that realized something that they missed in the past on on a contract? Oh gosh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're so expensive. They're so expensive.